get started. I'm Karen McTime Musil, a senior educational advisor to the CLDE coalition and serving as moderator. The people, at least on my screen to my right and my left, are the real fonts of wisdom uh, in this particular session, which is really you know, looking at how higher education can learn from the kind of uh, educational, really massive educational reform that K through 12 has had in the past decade or more in its commitment to make educational opportunities for students to be educated in democracy um, more available than it has ever been before, or at least in a very long time, and in and and in a new way. Um, my own K through 12 example, we had to have a ninth grade course, a single course, and it was as boring as you can imagine and as and, and really didn't you you wondered why you had it my kids had a similar thing where maybe they learned a few more facts um, they were a generation where they learned more facts about the constitution and but i don't think it really stimulated it wasn't enough it was a good it was a good beginning but it was never threaded to anything else you did so you know we're going to be talking to people who have been working to make it a much more comprehensive understanding of of civic engagement, who can do it, um, who has been doing it, and what kind of things they've been doing. Um, as you know, by this point, all of our sessions are recorded. Uh, I've asked for those of you coming in later. And um, uh, Cindy, how are you? It's wonderful to see you. Uh, she and I worked together on several uh, projects before. Uh, if you could just put who you are and where you're where you're working in what capacity so people may connect with each other through through this. Um, and for those of you who can uh, manage it, if you can use your uh, video so we can see you and interact with you, especially when you're talking, that would be a, a great a great boon. Um, the K through 12 session yesterday focused, on the civic pedagogies programs and practices that were used in both higher ed and and K through 12, and where there were commonalities and where there weren't uh, in trying to advance education for an informed, responsible, um, uh, engaged citizen in our diverse, divided, and inequitable democracy. But this afternoon session is really going to focus on the kind of policies that have been put in place to make more of this kind of learning available at more levels. And we have, um, we'll explore both the civic learning movement uh, uh, in K through 12, but what what ways we could be better allies in that work and what ways it might influence how we do our own work uh, on the campuses. And you have in Sean and Peter, uh, both people who have deep knowledge about K through 12, but also have been and are or were uh, professors uh, in, in higher ed. So they've really lived in both worlds and I think it will make them able to really give us good advice about how we could be a more strategic partners and more creative and more committed. I'll just say a few words about um, the two speakers and then toss them some questions and then ask you all to make comments or put questions in the chats or comments in the chats and we you know after each question we'll open up the floor a bit. Um, Sean Healy, after being a professor of public policy at the University of Illinois in Chicago and a civic learning and engagement scholar at the Robert McCormick Foundation, is now serving as senior director of policy and advocacy at iCivics. This is a group that describes itself as seeking to reimagine civic education for American democracy and champions, champions equitable nonpartisan civic education so the practice of democracy is learned by each new generation. And Sean comes to this conversation today with his added experience that I think he made a uh, comment on as chair of the Illinois Civic Mission, which helped pass uh, the statewide legislation to require civics education in schools in Illinois. And he can talk about the scope of that a little bit. Uh, Peter Levine was uh, trained as a moral political philosopher and has spent most of his career conducting the kind of applied empirical research and organizing professional efforts related to civic life, 
uh, to public deliberation, social movements. And he helped found what many of us are very familiar with, CIRCLE, the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement, uh, that he has stepped down from as the director. And most of us turn to that um, periodically during the year, but certainly uh, after elections. And he now directs the Tufts Civic Studies Program, uh, which has an undergraduate major. To our discussion, he will bring uh, his experience in K through 12, having staffed uh, earlier, I think it's 210 to 212, um, the draft of the Common Core Standards for Social Studies with the Council of Chief State School Officers, and as a longstanding member of the Common Standards for Social Studies used in the NAEP um, measurement of how we're doing each year. Um, and I will just function as a moderator. I, you know, come to this civic work, having woven it into the work I've probably done as a teacher all my life. And at AACNU, when I was in the overseeing the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Global Initiatives, democracy, whether I was talking about it in the global context in terms of diversity uh, or in terms of um, uh, being the lead author of Crucible, uh, has been you know lived alongside and is part of the way in which I the length of which I do it probably all of my work there. So the first question I want to throw out to uh, to Peter and Sean, and I think Sean, you might uh, take the first one, is, is kind of looking back. Those of us in higher ed don't have the same levers for change that you do in K through 12. That is, no one passes massive things that then tell us what to teach. Um, um, <laughs> Yes, imagine. Uh, but we may, you know, well, we, we may want to talk about that. Um, but but a stated goal for this forum was to bring the policy leaders and educators together to, to try and think of how, if we combined our forces, how we might make civic inquiry and projects part of every student's uh, degree plan. And if you look back at K through 12, what do you think were the, the most important kinds of policy successes that made K through 12 more uh, civic rich than it had been before those policies were planned. And maybe Sean, you could take a crack at that first. Sure, yeah, and at, at some point I, uh, today, I'd love to talk, of, I think we're gonna talk about some of the, the current work we're doing. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so we, we work at the state and the federal level. And there, there are definitely a few states, I think that have been models. And the first one I'm gonna uh, mention is probably much more controversial now uh, based on recent developments, um, but it's Florida. Uh, and, and Florida was a state uh, back in 2010 that adopted the, the Sandra Day O'Connor Civic Learning Act. And I'm gonna try to come up with a higher ed link uh, to each of these okay. cases. Okay, uh, great. In, in, that, in the case of Florida, they required a, a, a civics class in middle school. Uh, they attached it to a high stakes test uh, that involved uh, students' uh, promotion uh, to high school, but also the, the grade uh, of the school. And uh, there, uh, Peter can speak to this more definitely than me, but but there, there are definitely upsides and downsides uh, to that approach. <laughs> but but I, I will say as somebody that went to, to Florida and studied what they did uh, to try to bring those lessons uh, back home to where I live in Illinois, uh, is that uh, it forced them to take civics very seriously uh, in Florida. And key to that, and I think a, a common uh, a commonality of the three states I'll, I'll speak to briefly uh, is that th there's there's usually a, an institutional partner or source uh, behind the, these efforts, an institutional leader. And in this case, it was a, a there was a, a partnership uh, specifically between Bob Graham, former Senator Bob Graham, and Congressman Lou Fry. Uh, but they had institutes respectively at the University of Florida and the University of Central Florida, and they created this joint center on citizenship. Uh, which led the charge or helped lead the charge for passage of the law and has been uh, an implementation lead uh, in the years since. And for many of those years, uh, get, got a state appropriation, uh, provide professional development, develop uh, curriculum uh, and other resources uh, for, for classroom implementation. So that, that that's a really key model. Obviously, there's the culture wars that grip Florida now, and uh, there, there are some reforms at play there. I, I don't think they're all bad. I think there's actually a lot to learn from uh, even what's happening in Florida now. But uh, Florida is an example we held high. As I said, we use that as a lesson where I stand here in Illinois. Uh, we got a law passed 
uh, five years later that required civics in high school, uh, we actually got a little prescriptive about approaches. So we took uh, some of those uh, approaches that Peter uh, laid out way back in uh, 2003 in the Civic Mission of Schools report, uh, the so-called proven practices or promising approaches, uh, including discussing controversial issues, service learning, simulations of democratic processes. We went back to the legislature, got a, a parallel high school law passed uh, just three years ago. Uh, and uh, since 2015 have been in an implementation phase, mostly raised private resources uh, in our case to support implementation. But I will say a really important partner in implementation have been our colleges and universities in Illinois, because once again, we had to provide teacher professional development uh, at scale. And those colleges and universities have been physical hosts and have relationships uh, with teachers throughout our, our, our quite uh, big state uh, in terms of geography. Uh, and uh, they've also been partners in designing, we were kind of ahead head of the curve here, uh, designing uh, virtual uh, professional development opportunities. Most recently, actually, we've partnered with Florida uh, to develop uh, online courses where teachers can earn micro-credentials. And you talked about Circle, they've done some evaluation uh, of that work. I will also say Circle has been uh, an evaluation partner for all three states uh, that I'll mention. So the last one I'll mention is, is Massachusetts. Uh, they were the most recent entrant. Uh, 2018 passed a, a state law. Uh, once again, has a middle school civics course requirement, uh, has a project-based uh, component to it, uh, even has some, some uh, voter registration uh, dimensions to the bill. Uh, so there's, there's a lot to like there. Um, maybe the thing I like the most is it includes uh, appropriations, uh, created a, a fund for implementation, uh, and they, they've uh, been funded at a couple of years at a million and a half, and for the current fiscal year, got a $2 million uh, appropriation to, to do uh, teacher professional development. And uh, Peter can probably speak to this with more authority, but uh, Circle has certainly been a really important part uh, of that effort. And once again, studying what works and, 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 and what doesn't work, truly a coalition at play in, in Massachusetts. Um, so uh, we'll speak to what's going on now, I think in a little bit, uh, but, but in many ways we're trying to emulate uh, what, what has happened uh, in those three states over the course of the last decade plus. Peter, do you want to pick up on, on Sean saying that you could comment on some of this? <laughs> yeah, no, well, um, I mean, maybe I'll just, um, Briefly, but brought more broadly, say something about. I mean, because I know we're uh, I know a lot of the folks on the call, which is wonderful. Um, people, all, everybody here is thinking both K twelve and college, so nobody's new to this. But I, it's worth saying the the big picture. I think is that um, states have always had uh, civic education policies that are very influential. Sometimes they've been very bad because they prescribe the teaching of very bad things. Um, there's this har horrible study of Virginia textbooks. Um, in the way they address race until very recently, for example. But states have always required, so every single state has social studies standards. Um, uh, many states have, almost no, almost all states now have a high school course. Um, they A lot of states have tests of different kinds. They, they make other kinds of interventions. I mean, um, three, three big states buy the textbook for everybody. And we know from, um, from, various data that kids spend most of their time in social studies class with a textbook using a textbook and these are these are um so you know florida um texas and california by by the state say one text and just purchase them all for all the kids um and this um you know these are a big intervention i mean the just to give you a sense the the mcgraw hill american government textbook is 952 pages for students so it's not like students aren't getting anything given to them right now they may be way too much but and this is nothing new about this either states have been requiring um or offering social studies courses since the 1920s so when when you're operating i think in a k-12 zone you're you have a policy apparatus you have requirements of one kind or another standards in every single state now for social studies um and so you're trying to make them better um so the interventions that Sean mentioned are making things better. It's not like uh, Florida had no civics until the Senator Day O'Connor Act, but that changed the recipe. I think higher ed is just really different because um, there's much less, that many states don't really have, I mean, Massachusetts does have a, a state um, state 
government policy for its state universities regarding civic learning. But um, not every state does, and they don't have to. And then there's so much more autonomy at multiple levels, the universities within the universities, the units of them, and then the students. So every single kid in Florida is taking the um, middle school social studies course, but that's certainly nothing like that in higher ed. So I think the strategies are just very, very different. Most people in higher ed, everybody on this call is part of that, but I think we often think in terms of culture change and learn, sh sharing learning from place to place and um, influencing disciplines one by one. In K-12, you you more likely to say, let's require that everybody study this. Um, and there are good and bad parts of that because if the government is doing, requiring something bad, which many states have, it would be better if they didn't have this social studies policy, but it's also pretty straightforward to know what you have to do. The, the one other, so I just want to throw that out. The one other thing I want to say is there are a lot of interplays and there may be some unanticipated. So between K-12 and higher ed. So for example, the Sandra Day O'Connor Act, I've been told, I don't think this is a published finding, but I've been told increased enrollments in social studies methods courses in the state university system um, a lot. Because when you require an eighth grade or seventh grade, is it, I don't remember if it's seventh or eighth grade course, but you require a course, um, you know, you have a lot of jobs because you have to hire a lot of social studies teachers for the middle school. And that the word gets down to the very quickly to the state university system that this is something you should study so you can cert be certified for it. So, so um, the state uh, K-12 laws affect higher ed. And then the reverse is also in that case, as, as Sean said, in that case, the advocates for the law were based in universities, but also there's a whole bunch of, um, in order to make things go well, you have to have a whole bunch of um, people in universities helping, like, for example, training the teachers to do the, do the education. Um, I think there was one other thing I was going to say, but I'll, I'll, I'll remember later. Um, that's enough for the moment, I think. But just trying to think about how, how we think about the connections here. Right. And let me just ask, uh, at yesterday's uh, K-12 through higher ed discussion, Meg Hubert at the University of Virginia, who does a lot of work with um, out of school, I mean, with kids out of school, but they're in school, they're mm -hmm. youth development programs. She just, she said, um, everybody, civics needs to be taught everywhere and by everyone. What you're talking about are policy strategies that at least get it in one course. Most of them are connected to a course. Is that right? And what do you see about, or do you feel like having one course then makes it part of the conversation and then you can do it in other places as well? Did you yeah, know? well, again, Sean might want to weigh in on this, but I think part of it is a, there's a, a difference by grade level. So, you know, in, in high school, you you have the social studies department, and then you have inside that the American government or civics course. But although the American history courses and curriculum are very, very relevant. So one could think of the whole social studies department as providing civic education. I, I kind of do. Um, and then the debate is partly about how important it is to have those course mandates. And one of the arguments in favor is that it puts people in every school who are responsible for that. And so it, and it builds a field. So one of the biggest arguments in favor of a course requirement is that. But I just wanna say it's a K-12 thing. So your third grade teacher is not a social studies specialist, but does have civics standards, yes. certainly social studies standards, and usually put in terms of civics. Um, you know, we, a lot of us think that some of the biggest gaps, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna say deficits in a casual way. I mean, I'm married to a K-12 teacher, a third, an elementary teacher and have many, many close friends who are. But um, so I'm not one to say, shake my finger at anything, but it's it probably our biggest need in terms of enhancing the curriculum and the professional development is actually in the early grades because you, there you don't have um, such an easy hook. So sorry, Karen, but it was just a little bit more complicated answer. So, um, and nobody no, wants a like course that. in third grade. They, they want, but they, what they want there is to infuse. I mean, for example, one strategy that's been actively promoted is um, to make sure that the literacy, the reading curriculum starting in kindergarten has a fair amount of social studies type content in it right, um, right. so that the kids are literally reading about, um, you know, Martin Luther King, not just about stuff for right. yeah. animals. Um, and that's a very different strategy from trying to get a social studies class in the uh, right. high school. Yeah. And my 10 uh, year old grandson is giving a his first oral presentation, and he chose to do it on Nelson Mandela. So he is mm. going to be doing mm -hmm. a kind of yeah. very strong democratic subject matter. And my fourth, my sister who taught fourth grade, was very involved in the character counts movement, which is a, mm. a, a, 
private foundation, I think that promotes uh, something that was very similar to what I was doing at the college level with a Templeton grant on social responsibility. Mm -hmm. so in many ways, you know, they were, it was when I walked in and saw all the character counts on her bulletin board, I said, I'm doing the same thing at the college level, which was a nice kind of back and forth uh, that the two of us could see. Well, let me just you know, pause, push the pause button and see if any of you listening in on this want to make a comment about what, what the experience has been as you look back uh, in the K through 12 world, or whether as, as a higher ed person or policy person, you've weighed in on this world and um, been involved in ways we haven't yet talked about. Is there anybody that wants to raise their hand and um, turn off their mute button? Sure. A second. This is when the students stare at the floor. This is why I like to see people because I can just stare at the names instead of. <laughs> I'll jump in for briefly okay, and just you. say that Mar I'm you. Lena from Maryland and uh, nice to meet you all or, or see you again for some of you. Um, uh, so uh, Maryland has been you know, a big uh, supporter and uh, partner, we believe, with the national work um, uh, supporting the federal policy with a civic secures democracy in any in every way that we can. And we've also done a crosswalk for their state policy recommendations to look at sort of which of those are most appropriately aligned with where our strengths are in Maryland as a state and also where we could where we could make some investments um, and grow. And so we are in process uh, now with my partner Paul, who's on this call and others at the Maryland State uh, Coalition and looking at some advocacy efforts around um, strengthening, for example, you know, elementary um, instructional time for social studies, just as one example, something that was recommended at the national level applies to us at the state level. Um, and then as another example, recommendation at the federal level about, you know, infuse a course or have a course or strengthen standards, we're doing pretty well in that regard. And so we're not really putting any emphasis on those, you know, state policy recommendations, because that's not where we need to, to focus our efforts. But, um, uh, you know, I appreciate the guidance in this conversation. And I also appreciate the guidance um, from, from my civics and civics now and, and, and always what I can learn from Peter. Thank you. And I, I just wanted to lift up and do a shout out for, for Lena for leading a statewide coalition of amazingly different partners across the state in very different kinds of settings, talking to each other uh, about, you know, how how they could partner together, sometimes locally, but sometimes across the, the state. So it's really wonderful. And I look forward to, to learning more from you when I go to my first meeting tomorrow. So Okay, well, let me let me move on and, and have you do what I, Sean had indicated he was really eager to talk about, which is what's what's happening now. Um, what are some of the policy strategies that you are knee deep in right now or that you see in the horizon uh, that that uh, you expect might have an impact on the millions of students in K through 12? And again, is there are there ways higher ed could be a better partner in that? Um, then we do you envision ways or do you want to challenge us to do that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think uh, the, the world is our oyster and I think we're, we're making significant progress on uh, that partnership. And I will say just a, a shout out to, to Lena. Uh, I, I think the Maryland coalition we have at, at Civics now, we've built uh, coalitions now in 41 states. I think the Maryland coalition in particular uh, has has excelled in bringing young people and uh, students and, mm -hmm. and their voice uh, to the process, and it's it's a really inclusive uh, coalition. Uh, so not just of students, but 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 of students in particular. So a lot of us um, talk about the importance of, of youth voice and student voice. I think Maryland's uh, done, done an exceptional job there. Um, so. At the at the state level, uh, Lena talked a little bit about uh, we we put forth a, a state policy menu. We have model legislation, as Peter was discussing. Uh, often it starts with course requirements, uh, so we recommend a, a full year of high school civics. Only a handful of states have a full year, as Peter said. Almost every state uh, has at least an implied uh, semester in high school. Uh, more mixed bag when it comes to middle school. Um, about two thirds have implied. Only a handful have a, a hard standalone requirement. That leaves a little more than a third of states that that don't have a, a middle school uh, civics requirement. And then, as Lena said, we recommend 
uh, uh, instructional time for civics uh, in K-5. Uh, we've also got into things like uh, civic seals, uh, where we, we incentivize uh, uh, students uh, to, to excel in civics courses, but also to pursue uh, civics projects. Eight states have those already. It's actually a pretty diverse, uh, politically diverse set of states uh, that are doing those. Um, I, I was going to talk earlier in Peter's response to your last question about uh, a program we've we've done in uh, Illinois and some other states have emulated called Democracy Schools, which really does talk about uh, civics across the curriculum. I know that's something that uh, was evident. I was just, uh, Karen, rereading re the, the Crucible Moment report, and uh, that, that was a, a big charge there. And I'll say, like, as we did that work uh, in Illinois, we, we uh, did a survey at, uh, of students and teachers uh, at prospective democracy schools, put that together in partnership with, with Circle. Uh, and we, we found every year that uh, 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 super majority of students identified English, English language arts as a place they were talking about public issues, for example. Mm -hmm. But that was also uh, high numbers in science classes and in yeah. health classes and in foreign language classes. Uh, and I think the challenge is, uh, are there ways we could be more intentional about that? And that, that was something we deliberately tried to do uh, and are still trying to do in Illinois through a network of, of democracy schools. Um, so that, that's that's the state piece. Um, and uh, I, I will say, uh, you've heard a lot about the really difficult uh, political environment we've been in the last couple of years. But that said, um, you, you take those uh, policy recommendations of our menu, we count 16 laws that have been adopted in the last two years in 15 states. New Jersey's the one that has a two for here. <laughs> uh, that align with our policy menu. And some of them, uh, some of these measures were a big deal. Um, a couple of states required civics in high school for the first time, a couple of states required it in middle school. And yeah, there were things like adopting civic seals, experiential learning, excused absences for uh, students to pursue civic engagement. So it was a broad uh, menu. Many states are strengthening media literacy uh, requirements. Um, and we're, we, we have several lines in the water, as you might expect, uh, as the page turns to, to, to the spring legislative sessions. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're doing this in a, a once again, a very politically diverse uh, allotment of states uh, across the country. And that's really important. Uh, civics yeah. can't be a partisan uh, issue, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll, I'll end just by saying, uh, since last March, since March 2021, we've been pursuing a, a big federal bill called the Civic Secures Democracy Act uh, would bring a billion a year to, to uh, civic education uh, over a five-year period. It has uh, bicameral and bipartisan co-sponsorship. Uh, it actually has significant funding for higher ed. So uh, of that billion, 200 million uh, is earmarked for higher ed, 150 million of that for pre-service teaching programs. Uh, 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 basically, a third of that money uh, is earmarked, 35% of that money is earmarked for HBCUs and MSIs. Um, and then uh, there's a $50 million uh, allotment for research. Um, I acknowledge that uh, we're, we're uh, our, I think our, our FY23 band aid of a budget expires this Friday. Uh, and there, there's talk that there'll be at least another band aid for a week. Um, and our bill is not going to pass on its own this session, uh, but we're, we're hopeful that uh, civics will be included in an appropriations bill um, uh, should, it, should, it, uh, should it pass uh, before the end of this Congress, and we'll have something significant to build on. And what I'm really proud of is just the way our coalition, we now have 260 plus organizations uh, including the Maryland uh, coalition that's represented here, uh, that have fought really tirelessly for this bill. And uh, we, we've had hundreds of meetings uh, with legislative offices, some of them difficult meetings. Uh, we brought thousands of constituents uh, to those meetings and uh, made the case for stronger civic education and built really strong bipartisan coalitions in so doing. Uh, so it makes me really optimistic even as we go into a divided Congress uh, next year about our prospects for the future. Thank you.
That's fascinating. Peter, did you want to do a do -si do with? Well, I think I might just add the uh, a word about the Educating for American Democracy uh, project that I just put the link in. Um, but, you know, part of, I just want to say part of the reason that we have reasonable prospects of actually getting a bill through Congress is because of people, of Sean and a very small number of other people that are working on it. So um, there's the hard, skillful work of actually getting um, legislation passed, which, um, but some of you know the Educating for American Democracy work. Some of you have even been involved in different ways. Um, I just want to give a plug for it. it you know, um, it, it was a specific project which has an implement, which is an implementation phase now, funded by the federal government during the Trump administration, with the charge of of um, coming to an agreement about the core content for both American history and 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 civics um, from K to twelve. And um, so, part of it is is a document which actually lays out what seemed to us to be the high priority content question uh, matters from K to twelve. Uh, and then there's a, a theory of change behind that. I mean, one way into it is to say, I see this as a way of, or I, I don't know if others agree, but I personally see this as a way of changing the conversation a little because often the conversation is about how so terrible adults don't know, you know, literally 50% of American adults don't know the three branches of government that's in the this year's Annenberg study. So we have to do something in K-12 and basically we have to teach kids stuff. And that there's this kind of um, weird, uh, gap between that sort of analysis and then the, when you realize that the McGraw-Hill textbook is 952 pages long and that um, states are buying that thing for every single student and then students are taking courses of at least a semester long so if kids don't know either if adults don't know that there are three branches of the government then there's a weird kind of anomaly because they we're actually being taught that over and over again so the problem isn't quite that which is not to say that we don't want the courses. And in fact, we need a year, not half a year, but we also have to think about kind of the quality. And so, well, obviously the quality. Um, so the what the everyday democracy, that means what the Educating for Democracy roadmap does is it, it, it reduces the number of questions. So one of the problems here is that state standards are incredibly voluminous um, and they accrue because uh, there's no incentive for anybody ever to take anything out of the standards and state legislatures in particular like to add them. So there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages along, and that's what leads to the 952 page textbook. The textbook, by the way, is written in order to accommodate as many state standards as possible. So the way the textbook is actually written is that people read the standards in all the states, they make a spreadsheet with all the state standards, they figure out what all the total standards are. And for each standard, they write an explanatory paragraph answering it. So if, this, if a standard is how many votes does it take to pass a bill in Congress and somebody writes a paragraph and it adds up to 952 pages. So there's sort of an incoherence and an overwhelming amount. And so we tried to rethink it in terms of really compelling questions that I don't think we use the phrase compelling questions because that's sort of trademarked, <laughs> but we, um, big deep questions that um, people might want to think about for the rest of their lives and not just think about and for the test and then get passed. It also raises the, in a way, it becomes more manageable because it's much, much shorter. If you if you use the roadmap instead of a real state standard, you'd be cutting to 5% the length of the document. But it's also really challenging questions. And so there's a professional development need that's pretty, some people think unrealistic, that the, the kind, because you're not teaching the kids that there are three branches of the government, you're asking the students to evaluate fundamental questions like to what extent is the United States a, has been a decent or not decent society over its history. That's that's a paraphrase. These are hard questions to deal with. And so the professional development uh, pre-service and in-service um, expectations are super high. And this is, for me, the number one place where higher ed is relevant because um, we're just going to have to have a lot more teachers. By the way, not just social studies teachers and not even just teachers because also parents and others who are involved with schools who... Um, can deal with the kind of questions that, uh, in that in that list. And I don't think our schools have ever been asked to do that, which is not to say that we're so powerful that now they're being asked. I mean, we're just, we're just a voice. But as a voice, we're saying that we need to amp up the intellectual content of the material a lot, and that's gonna be challenging. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I I don't know it well enough to quote from it, but I remember when I looked at the Education for American Democracy being struck with how 
uh, how challenging it was and how original it was and how informative it could be to those of us in higher ed if we started thinking about those questions where we are. So I, 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 I really feel like that is a document that would be useful for higher ed to read as well as for uh, the K through 12 teachers. Um, you know, one, and Terrence, just quickly, and one, one thing that I'd love to see happen, and it's by no means a panacea, in fact, it's a very modest idea, would be to have a fairly common one, one um, probably one semester, um, three credit hour course that was on some of those core issues in college. I know, I know that's pretty superficial, but um, it would be better, and it would be a, an opening for some students to pursue more, and it would need to be a partnership of, of the history department, the political science department, and the ed education school, if you have all three. Not everyone has all three, but those would be the three stakeholders because it's it's history and government, and it's about educating people, so it would have to be. Um, and I don't know that that's really available. Actually, I don't know of any. I mean, there are wonderful courses, and there's all kinds of configurations, but I don't know that there's that. I've never heard of that course. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting thing to think about and to take back. And, you know, I was thinking, Lena, that, you know, a discussion along a coalition, whether there'd be anybody that might experiment and do some pilot work on that, whether University of Maryland, one of its systems might, you know, pair with a school and, um, it, you know, it'd be very, very interesting. It seems to me that in Maryland, at least, we also have a service learning requirement and that too could be tapped as a source of information and a source of uh, partners who could be part of this discussion about these deeper questions. I mean, some of the students who do the service learning, if they tied that into questions, is America delivering democracy to everyone? Um, what are you finding? Um, what are you hearing from the people you're interacting with? I mean, you, you, you would you would layer the students learning in another arena with a question that may have come out of a, a, a social studies or history course, but it would influence, they would influence each other. Well, let me just pause a second here sure. and see whether anybody um, mind is, is exploding like mine. And I'm wondering, Cindy, not to put you on the spot, but uh, you know, as Sean was talking about um, meeting with legislators, uh, Cindy is, is at Willamette and and across from the state capitol and has involved students. She renamed her, the, the major that used to be called communications is now called civic communication, which then, then ends up um, foregrounding the purpose of learning the skills in communication. But I don't know whether, you know, in, in listening to Peter and Sean talk, whether that made you think, ooh, you know, we could weave this into one of the courses we do, did you? Yeah, absolutely. And my apologies, Karen. I think I have pretty weak bandwidth here. So it cut out or froze while you were speaking um, about what we've done in civic communication and media. But um, it's just so exciting to be here and listen to Sean and Peter talk about, um, I mean, the tremendous strides that you're making institutionally and nationally, and just think about how that might connect with a small program like ours. I know that we have so many students and also just faculty on the ground um, who are deeply concerned about what's happening with democracy and um, are coming out of high school here in Oregon without much education um, in that regard. So, you know, Sean, I'm sure you're aware we just passed in 2021, right? Our first bill to require civic education. It's a half credit at the high school level. Um, and I'm really interested in trying to figure out by working with folks at the state level, how can we help support the implementation um, of some good programs here in Oregon and at least have a strong building block. And I know so many other people are working on that, but um, every time I hear both of you talking about how higher ed can be a partner and build on the work that you're doing, um, I'm really interested to learn more about that. <laughs> and, and I guess I just wanted to name something that was neither history nor education nor we, we don't have something called so government you know poli sci you know that that it and i'm thinking you know interdisciplinary gen ed courses uh project-based learning there's lots of ways in which higher education and its professors have a a, a freer disciplinary range uh particularly 
particularly in liberal arts and uh, high admission schools where, where the, the curriculum is more fluid than it might be at a uh, research focused um, uh, campus. But anyone else want to jump in with an idea from where you sit? I'll say just a couple things. Um, so, as my in my role as an endowed <clears throat> professor for civic learning and engagement, I work in both the K twelve world and the higher ed world because I'm also a, <clears throat> in teacher education. So, over the last few years, we've done in the professional development side of things, we've created um, micro credentials um, for uh, teachers to be able to do self paced professional development or. Um, directly aligned with the um, Massachusetts <clears throat> social studies standards that um, in added, it, it came out in 2018, the new standards, but you know, this focuses on the civics enhancement that was done to those standards. So we have that, but then we also do, um, we also work directly with T, uh, the schools in our region in different ways to um, involve their students working with our students around um, civic action like projects, if you will, um, um, having to do with the sustainable development goals, because it's one of those things that, <clears throat> you know, a 10 year old can 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 learn about the SDGs, the, the, um, the UN's um, global goals, can learn about and think about for local action. And then our students can do the same. So we so we 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 pro we work together on projects. Um, we we get education students working with elementary students in that way, thinking about their communities. Um, but on, but recently what I've done at the higher ed level is we now have a civic engagement digital badge that students can earn um that is you know digital badging are you know they're like permanent uh, reflection of of co-curricular things that you can add to your linkedin you can add to your resumes if you're submitting things electronically um <clears throat> when it's time to graduate and so we have that as a co-curricular thing but curricularly if that's a word um i have an initiative with like nine different faculty members from nine different programs across colleges and what i'd asked them what you know asked invited them to do was to think about <clears throat> adding a civic very specifically and intentionally a learning outcome in their course one of the required courses um, that would directly deal with what what um, a, a civic inequity or a civic issue or or something that uh, like how the government may affect their future profession, for instance, right? Um, so we have from finance and accounting and health sciences and we have um, anthropology. So these professors from different um, programs, degree programs have have joined on to this and um, even from history and political science as well, even though, you know, that's in there that obviously, like Peter said, that's that's civics learning, being a major right of, of one of those two programs. However, what about all the other students like, if, like, for instance, finance and accounting, like, well, okay, so, so you graduate with a degree in finance, and like, then you live in a community and you think, hey, wait a minute, I have something to contribute, maybe I should you know, try to become a member of the finance committee for the town, like that kind of way we're trying to think about helping our students see their role in, as a, a citizen um, working in civic action within their communities and professions once they graduate. So it's a lot, but we, we keep keep chipping at it, we keep working at it, and it, it grows all the time. So we have, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to, you know, expand this initiative to another bunch of professors as we keep going on it because it seems to be kind of taking a life of its own and i'm really happy about that it's great work it, it you know it raises to me sorry uh, karen to preempt oh, no. your uh, chair chairpersonship but it, it raises there's i think there's a thread in the conversation actually about the disciplines and how to think about them which is so first i think everybody probably based on body language reaction to joe thinks that it's great that that civics is interdisciplinary which i do too um it, it's it's also challenging in the it, putting the interdisciplinary world of college together with the with the world of k-12 i mean one thing is there's a lot of uh, intellectual diversity and ferment in k-12 so a, a good high school social studies department probably is teaching gender studies and 
uh, sociology and lots of things. And then in college, there's lots of disciplines that apply. There's no discipline called civics, except at Tufts, we actually have a civic studies program, but that's weird, but mostly, and then, so you have these kind of, they have these two big stakeholder disciplines, which are history and political science, but interestingly, they don't really teach what they, what is taught in K-12 exactly. For example, historians don't like the broad, um, the, the big, the big picture narrative very much anymore and don't offer it very much. Whereas the K-12 history is, you know, Columbus to, to, to Donald Trump um, in, a, in a quick march and they don't really, you know, so there are these sort of intellectual gaps. Um, and then there's the fact that, as, as you pointed out, Karen, earlier, that something like service learning, which could be a pedagogy, can both cross both sectors, but also can is a place where K-12 might actually have more to offer to, so to the, to higher ed is innovation. So, you know, so for example, political, classic American gov, political science 101 is not at all in, involved in engagement. It's all about how the government works. So, and so there's a, and it's not what we, anyway. And so, and so, I mean, one kind of asset we have is we have this thing called civics in high school, which doesn't actually exist in college, which is interdisciplinary and kind of applied, but doesn't fit very neatly with the disciplines. So I just think there's a lot of intellectual work to be done. I think I think the two, you know, maybe there's three or four, but at least the two things that come to mind first for me from what can higher ed do are one, professional development, and two, the intellectual work of the kind of connecting, you know, um, on the Educating for American Democracy group, we had two voices that stick with me. I mean, we had, we had Jane Kaminsky as a, a Harvard uh, historian and a really good historian saying historians have developed all this kind of micro history and social history, which is what she does and which is fabulous, but have no, very few people, Jill Laporte might be one, are kind of putting that back into a grand narrative. So that's intellectual work that needs to be done. And then uh, Danielle Allen kept on pointing out that in, in um, political science in college, we think a lot about social movements, um, for example, and social movements are not in the K-12 curriculum hardly at all. So these are the kind of translations that need to be done. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted before we before we end to give Sean and Peter and the rest of you a chance to think a little bit about, about the equity question, which has been very uh, foregrounded for, I think, in both higher ed and in K through 12. That is, with all of these new practices, we discover that they aren't available or as available to some students you know, uh, as they are to others. That, and that happens around high impact practices, that happens around opportunities for doing student government work or other kind of school activities where you're, you're, you're actually uh, learning a lot of democratic organizing skills in order to make something happen in your, in your school. Um, but, but a student who lives in a dangerous neighborhood has to get the bus home because it's too late to work and there isn't one later, so they don't go to it. So, I mean, there's all these kinds of inequities. How are, what are you finding are the most effective ways of, of being sure that with these reforms, they, um, they really bring everybody uh, it, to the table and not just some? Well, I'll start by saying, you know, I, th I think tr policy can be a big driver uh, for equity. Uh, just just uh, back in my state in Illinois, uh, when we were pushing for a high school law, um, we did a, a study and found about 60% of high schools were already teaching civics or government without a mandate. But then, as you'd expect, uh, when we looked at where it wasn't being taught, uh, one place in particular was Chicago Public Schools, which was 20% of the students in the state. Uh, it's it's 90% students of color. It's uh, over 80% uh, free or reduced lunch. So there there are huge equity issues, and similarly, we we saw that in some of our our rural areas. Um, so uh, the policy itself uh, made that opportunity universal, but then obviously resourcing implementation uh, is really critical. And we did a statewide push that I talked about earlier, and. Frankly, the colleges and universities in the more rural parts of the state were really critical uh, on the rural equity side. Um, but but for the city of Chicago, my old uh, job was in philanthropy, and we had a, a specific uh, partnership with Chicago Public Schools and a significant uh, investment in implementation in the district. Uh, so that I, I would say uh, 
resourcing implementation in an equitable way is absolutely critical. Um, another thing I'll say, I, I used to fund in journalism and uh, one piece I was particularly concerned about was uh, we looked at the pipeline of journalism, which like teaching and the legal profession go down the list is, is, is not reflective of our population, right? And what was stunning to me was that um, journalism opportunities in Chicago public schools have basically gone away and they're, the, the ones that are still present are the ones in the more white affluent schools in the district, right? Um, but there was this really interesting uh, program at uh, Loyola University where they were partnering with a few neighborhood uh, high schools and actually uh, publishing um, a, a local newspaper uh, wow. that covered the community. And they were, uh, through grant funding, uh, paying the students. Um, so as we worked with, with schools in Illinois, um, extracurricular opportunities were actually quite abundant, but, but there's a real equity issue, as you said, Karen, uh, who can, in who can access them. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with just, it's kind of a scattered response, but a piece of the Civic Secures Democracy Act that I'm really excited about and I'm hoping emerges in this final bill uh, is something called the Prince Hall Fellowship that Daniel Allen uh, named. Uh, which would uh, bring uh, funding uh, to incentivize uh, people of color to join the ranks uh, of civics teachers. Uh, civics teachers are even less representative um, of our population than, than other uh, academic disciplines uh, in middle schools and high schools. And uh, th this program would incentivize people of color to join the ranks, uh, provide uh, financial uh, incentives for the first five years uh, of their teaching experience. So. Uh, those are a few of the mechanisms that I think uh, we should think about and uh, hopefully a good couple of good higher ed examples in there. Thank you. I, I, th I think Sean gave all the important answers. I, uh, I mean, answered so well to your question. I would just throw in two kind of dimensions. One is, I don't think it's the main thing, but I think we always need to have an eye on the actual deficits in civic knowledge that are held especially by very privileged kids and uh, especially by white kids um, who are demonstrably the least likely to understand a bunch of things from, from uh, about uh, injustice in American history or about the criminal justice system. I'm not just making this up. There's there's oh, there's wow. studies where they're asked um, factual questions and they're the least likely to get them right. So there's kind of, you know, people bring different experiences, but it's it's not always um, the, the best off students who have the most relevant civic experience. Um, um, and the other thing is just to say, I know, Karen, you kind of wanted to talk about this a little bit anyway, but what's what about the people who aren't in college because they didn't go ever or because they went to college a long time ago and they left? And I, there, there's a role for higher ed in, in, in educating those or being part of educating those people too. I've been doing this project the last year with uh, Germans and Americans. We, we visited each other's countries and um, learned a lot. And there's this interesting thing that um, the US government had a huge imprint on both Germany and the United States in the late 1940s because we were occupying Germany. And we, we had two huge policy um, moves to try to protect democracy against basically against communism at the time. And in, in the United States, we ramped up higher ed. And so the Truman Report, if, if any of you haven't read it or haven't read it for a long time, it's worth reading. It's online. It's about 1948. And it's fascinating because it's all about democracy. It's propaganda against communism, but it's all about democracy. And it says the way to solve, save democracy is to promote higher education access to it, of course, but also the content that every lots of people need to go to higher ed and they need to learn about democracy. But at the same time in Germany, we were requiring them to do adult education and they still have it. So they have a whole adult education system in Germany. They have all these centers that are community based that are typically have a they have some autonomy and they typically have a name like it's the, you know, the helmet coal center or whatever, but they are getting uh, federal and state and European Union funding and they have a whole um, they have fresh profession. So you can go to college as a first year college student to learn adult democratic education. And therefore you can study that with a professor at that. And then you can go work at the Helmut Kohl Center and you can get grants and you can have a career. It's a whole infrastructure and it's um, it's more equitable because it's because it, uh, one just on lifetime, uh, life scale thing, you, it's open to a 70 year old, but also it's, um, it's, it's not just reaching people, it's reaching people in their um, sort of voc vocational tracks. And so um, we thought we were being more equitable by expanding access to higher ed 
which I guess we did and led the world for a while, but I think they've caught up in Europe on that anyway, right? So we don't even lead on that, but we don't have the other piece. And so, so the only, the only, the construct in my, if I had a magic wand, I, I'd create an adult education, you know, program in America, but that'd be very tough. I think one step short of that is to recognize that our higher ed does adult education. It actually already does right. programs, speakers, right. but we just need to really own that, that our job is um, adult education outside of the, outside of our own students and what are we doing about that and and some community colleges where adults go not to get a degree but because they want to take things it doesn't direct them toward absolutely what you're saying in terms of um education for participation in a democracy but um that th that might be a nice a nice fit for some centers that uh, would already attract and are available and set up to reach adult populations very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Let me just ask, uh, we've only got one or two minutes left. Um, it, well, we don't actually have that. It is now 440. Oh, and I think sorry. I have to, no, 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 no that's fine. This was very lively. I want to thank Sean and Peter for wonderful ideas and uh, your dog as well. Um, <laughs> you know, if my cat were here, he'd be hissing at that dog. But um, I hope that some of you here are going back home with good ideas of, of things and conversations you want to continue. So what we've sparked here will um, be the embers for some exciting new possibilities and thinking uh, in the future. I think we are moving now into the final session. Saya, are you still on? I don't. I'm here. Normally, Oh, there you are, right next to me. Um, I don't have my program. It's Carol Schneider doing a closing session. And I don't know whether you want to sort of move. Sure, her session it. is um, on our draft framework for civic and democratic learning. And um, she's also looking at abundant, great civic learning practice. But what are the guiding purposes? So it should be a good session. Um, you'll have to go back. You'll have to leave Zoom and go back to the platform to view right. it. Well, again, thank you so much for being here. Nice to see some old friends and to meet some new people like you, Joe, and learn more about what exciting work you're doing. And thank you again to Sean and to Peter. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, that was fun.